it's full screen on my oh that's not full screen oh there we go cool um, so yeah my name is Leilani um, I have nothing to disclose except that I have a blog and you should follow it <laughs> uh, so let's go ahead and start at the beginning this is me this was around age two um, and I've already checked they don't make the dress in adult sizes um, which I think is really unfortunate but um, this was around the time when I was to have my first ever surgery. Uh, my parents have this sliding mirrored door in their closet, and I feel like the parents in the room might know where this is going. Um, my big toe became the victim of that door, um, and I was rushed to the ER and would like to think that the uh, first year medical student who sewed up my toe, um, his work will live on forever. <laughs> But little did I know that this was to be the beginning of a life full of pokes and prods and IVs and surgical steel, but let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. So fast forward, this is me at age six. This was my first ever real surgery. And you can tell at the time that medicine wasn't super scary at that age. Um, I was to have a tonsillectomy and to have my adenoids and a small cyst removed. Um, but pretty quickly the, uh, you know, the magic wore off, and I decided maybe being, you know, hospitalized isn't super for me. Um, and my family closed the book on what we thought was going to be my only ever real surgery. So fast forwarding another seven years, and I'm kind of the all-American kid. I balanced Girl Scouts with doing a lot of sports, karate, soccer, swimming, um, pretty much anything. Not to say I was great at any particular sport, um, but I tried it all. So it was quite a shock to my family, to all of us, that I would be found seizing on the floor of my parents' garage. In fact, that's not even accurate. I didn't find myself, I have no memory of this event, um, just of waking up in the hospital and being told that I had survived an aborted sudden cardiac death due to an underlying diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And my entire life at that point changed. Doctors insisted, no more sports for you. Um, I had an ICD implanted and there was no need to risk um, hurting the device that was planted you know, near centimeters from the top of my chest. I'd already survived one cardiac arrest, there was no need to induce another. So naturally, about six months later, <laughs> I was asked to participate in a relay in PE. Um, and I was told, you know, it's only one lap, you don't have to run it very fast. So of course, around three quarters of the way around the track, um, I found myself face down in the dirt, uh, waking up from what was another cardiac arrest where this time the ICD had fired properly. So I would need the shock again twice more before I turned 21. One time for scaling a construction site, which, okay, fair enough, that's kind of on me. Um, and then the second time, uh, coming out of class at NYU um, and just completely losing consciousness in the middle of Second Avenue. But I would go on to go to college, get my degree, start a career, and it shouldn't have surprised me, living outside that two to three percent, uh, sorry, inside that two to three percent chance, uh, that standard deviation, that my HCM would progress to transplant. But it did surprise me. By now I kind of sort of knew who I was. Um, I was starting to make my way in the world. And that overly strong heart was there for all of it. I knew my heart and it knew me. In fact, this was me. This was my heart about 30 minutes after, there we go, <laughs> after it was explanted. And the very nice research tech um, at Stanford sent me photos that I got the next morning, which was pretty cool. She even labeled them for me, which was very helpful. Um, but, you know, though we should have been thinking about the many years, the many decades to come with this brand new heart, instead we started counting time in moments. The right atrium of the donor heart failed about 24 hours after transplant. Um, we had no you know, known cause. Was it being too long on ice? Was it the fact that the heart came via plane? We didn't know. Um, so I was put on VA ECMO, cannulated in the right clavicle, and then right in my rib cage. Um, unfortunately, though, it wasn't cannulated properly, so then they went back in um, and had to redo it. Um, you might even recognize a familiar braid in the photo. Um, this was when I first met Susan, um, and she was incredibly instrumental in making my recovery um, 
much less scary. So if she doesn't mind, I'm gonna read a little excerpt um, from some remembrances that I wrote about the time. I'll never forget the day when I was brought back into consciousness, something relatively unheard of at Stanford at the time for someone living on ECMO. At first, my entire body was shaking uncontrollably. The muscles in my legs felt as though I had just run a marathon, and despite three layers of blankets and the hemodynamic control of the ECMO, I was freezing. Breathe, Susan says. It's the morning of the fourth day, and Susan has just taken over shift from the night perfusionist. She takes my right hand in her left and tucks the blanket in with her right hand. Just breathe, Leilani. It's okay. You're awake. Think of your favorite place. What's some place that brings you peace? I close my eyes trying to flood them with memories of powdered sugar sand and blue skies and waves, but the lower half of my body feels out of sync with the top. It's as if there's two tectonic plates gyrating in syncopation. Within, I feel like I'm thrashing to and fro, though visible movement is but centimeters. Hawaii, I croak, wrestling my brain from this weird Richter scale of a body. Suddenly, my grandmother happens to walk in the room, visiting before she went to work that morning. Instinctively, she knows something is wrong, and she grabs my other hand. She feels like she's in a washing machine, says Susan. We're trying to calm it. Grandma takes up where Susan left off. Just breathe, she says. I close my eyes and notice that despite the continued flow of air from the HVAC overhead, my body has somehow grown warmer. Fortunately, the balloon pump came out that day, and so I no longer had to feel like I was in a washing machine. So I began to regain some semblance of myself, trying to understand what had happened, you know, why we had gotten to this point. Um, and it was hard for me to rationalize. I couldn't understand how I had, you know, gotten this new heart and yet was suddenly so sick. First came the realization that I was sick enough to have needed the transplant. I had the opportunity to go into the path lab and hold my own heart about four months after it came out. And I could understand why the left ventricle had been so um, hypertrophied, where the rings of scar tissue were. In fact, in this image, you can see it very distinctly how truly diseased the heart was. But complication after complication continued to sort of follow me after transplant. I kept being in that two to three percent. And, you know, I, I tried to do all the things I hadn't been able to do before. For example, I'd started school for musical theater. And then after transplant was diagnosed with necrotizing pneumonia, probably a complication from being bedridden for so long. Um, and so singing again was a challenge. Similarly, I started running again, hadn't done that in about 10 years. Um, before I was diagnosed with the worst case of a vascular necrosis in my knees that my transplant team had ever seen. So I really didn't know what to make of this new life. You know, I feel like in the industry, everyone is so grateful to have this chance to be alive and do all these things they couldn't do before. Um, but that really wasn't my case at the time. And I'm going to sort of pause now and take a breather because what comes next, I kind of like to think of like when you're sitting in a movie and the plot's like kind of already revealed itself at this point, um, but you know because you bought your ticket early that there's like 20 minutes left, so they have to fit something more into the movie before it ends. So we fast forward a year. February 3rd, 2017, one year exactly to the day from my transplant. I'm up in Sonoma trying to celebrate, um, just process what's happened, and I'm sitting on a couch scrolling through Instagram, and all of a sudden I completely lose consciousness again. A Holter study, an electrophysiology study, a cardiac MRI, an angiogram, a biopsy, a xyopatch, nothing can explain why I suddenly lost consciousness again one year to the date of my transplant. So at that point, since we'd exhausted every minimally invasive option, I agreed to have a Reveal Link loop recorder, a Medtronic product, put in in the hopes that we could catch the reason for the syncope sometime within the three-year lifespan of the battery of this device. So of course, following the trajectory of what's happened so far, only six days later, <laughs> I lose consciousness again. Stereo strips hadn't even worn off. And it was determined that I had experienced a 30-second episode of complete heart block um, with a heart rate of around 20 beats per minute. That night, I cried so hard, I felt like I was just going to fall through the hospital floor. I, I really couldn't understand at that point how 
everything had happened right after transplant, but then things had started to improve. You know, we thought I had this new heart that was going to be okay for a while. And though I didn't fully understand the significance of complete heart block, I knew it meant another device. And this time it was a pacemaker. <coughs> and though I thought it had been sealed for the last time, that incision, you know, just above my uh, left chest was opened again. So I've just hit my two year anniversary this February. And sometimes people don't know whether to clap or not. Don't worry, neither do I. <laughs> And so it's become this journey of trying to find the joy when times don't necessarily bring it out very obviously. Through social media, I've been able to connect with a plethora of other transplant patients, even other ECMO survivors. Some of them remember their time on it, some of them don't, for which I'm sometimes envious. But we share this bizarre bond, and in doing so, we stretch the limits of what's possible for transplant patients by helping each other up the mountain. Because I feel like sometimes in the industry, the image of recovery is much more like the left, when in reality, it's really more like the right. In the right, this picture was taken a couple weeks ago. I was up in Hawaii, and even with my bum knees and this pacemaker in my body, I was still able to summit this mountain, a mountain overlooking a beach that I have been to almost every year of my life but had never been able to see from up this high. Going through this experience has also given me the ability to give back, to come speak to people like you, to device manufacturers, policymakers, med students, pre-med students, people interested in healthcare. It's given me the opportunity to teach the importance of patient-provider partnership in greater patient-centered outcomes. It's been able to connect me with and advocate for patients who didn't have access to a center of excellence like I did, um, who might live in a remote area and don't understand that they could be seeing clinicians who specialize in their disease. It's been able to give me action, uh, the opportunity to give actionable feedback to stakeholders on improving the patient quality of life in addition to improving clinical outcomes. And it's allowed me to advocate for policy changes in transparency of data. But most importantly, I think it's given me the opportunity to process what's happened and been able to express that through my blogging work, the, the tops and bottoms, the high and low points of transplant. And to be able to give voice to people like me who have always been at the heart of what you do, pun heavily intended. <laughs> So I hope I've given you a little window to the outside, um, life after those tubes come out, because it's been complicated and rocky and beautiful and strange and surprising, and it contains multitudes, as do we all, patients, technicians, caregivers, clinicians, all of us. So thank you. I knew I would cry during this too, so, but I would like to invite her mom, Susan, up at this time too. I think we have, this is a great opportunity to be able to ask the parents questions too. With her mom and dad that was there, and her, she mentioned her grandma was also, but these are the two most stoic parents I'd ever seen sitting at a bedside with their daughter. You know, I have children this age also, I'm crying already, but you know, just to see, go through this also, I just felt like I felt their pain the whole time. But I just want to, yeah, if there's any questions or anything for her mom or, and her dad was just so stoic and such great support for them too. But I just want to, her blog is something If like she did mention her blog at the beginning too. If you have it, or I do encourage you to go on the, her website and on her blog and, and follow her because she's just an amazing writer, presenter as we've seen, and she's just a marvelous person. I think it's great to celebrate our successes like we are. Yeah. <laughs> Come up here. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Bill Harris. Um, wonderful. Thank you for sharing.